Okay, so today's topic is going to be DNA. So we're going to focus today on the structure of DNA and the function of DNA. Um, so first of all, let's talk real quick about what DNA stands for. Okay, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, deoxyribose is the sugar, okay, um, and DNA is a nucleic acid. Remember, that was one of our... Um, one of our organic compounds. Okay, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay, um, DNA is found in all types of cells, prokaryotic, eukaryotic, it doesn't matter. Now, it is a little bit different in a prokaryotic versus a eukaryotic cell. In a prokaryotic cell, the DNA is not enclosed in a nucleus, so this is its DNA right there. So it's not enclosed in a nucleus. It is a single, a singular, single strand circular chromosome that is not included in a nucleus. Okay? In a eukaryote, the DNA is included in the nucleus here. Okay? And you can see how in a, in a eukaryotic cell, it is a double-stranded, okay? tightly wound in the form of chromosomes. And you'll see these are not circular. So here's my chromosome there. So prokaryotic cells, um, the DNA is not enclosed in a nucleus. It is a single strand, single singular circle strand, okay? And a eukaryotic cell, it is enclosed in the nucleus. It is a double strand, okay, that's gonna be wound into these chromosomes. You can see as we progress through this picture here, okay, it's wound tighter and tighter. Here the DNA has the double helix. Here in the first picture, starts to wind around histones, and it will continue to wind and wind and wind and tighten up as it gets into that chroma. Uh, chromosome format. Okay, okay so um, let's talk a little bit about what the actual genome is. Okay, so some of you guys have probably heard of uh, genome projects where they're mapping the genome. So the genome is the complete set of the organism's DNA or chromosomes. Okay, so the genome contains all of the DNA. Okay, every single bit of the DNA. So the genome Again, is all of the DNA, all of the chromosomes, every single complete set of it. Okay. A chromosome is going to be just a portion of the DNA, so it's a chunk of the DNA, so it's a little bit smaller. So as we work our way down this line, okay, we're getting smaller and smaller. Whereas, so in your picture here, this would be a chromosome. Okay. So that's a chromosome. And then a gene is going to be a portion of the chromosome. So you can see here, over here, we pulled out a gene. And so a gene codes for one particular protein. Okay? And there are basically two kinds of genes. There are um, intron and exons. So again, genes code for one particular protein. That's the job of DNA, is to code for proteins. And genes are these small sections of DNA, so these small little sections of DNA that are coding for one particular Pro, um, one particular protein. And in this gene, we have uh, in, what are called introns and exons. Okay? And so the introns here are called the junk DNA. So these are not expressed. Okay? Whereas the exons, this is what is expressed. That's where the, uh, you associate your EX with. Okay? So the exon portion of the gene, for instance, here, here, that's what we're going to see show up. Let's say this is a gene here for hair color, and your hair is brown. That means these exons here are producing proteins that make your hair look brown, where this intron here is not producing anything. It is not expressed. Okay, so introns are not expressed, exons are expressed. And you'll see more of this when we do protein synthesis uh, next. Okay, so let's um, talk a little bit about the function then of DNA. So over here on the left, we have our DNA model. It's in a double helix format. Okay, and the job of DNA, DNA's function is to code for proteins. That's what DNA does. Like we just said with our hair color example, maybe you're talking skin color. Maybe you're talking about a particular hormone or digestive enzymes. All of those are proteins. That's the job of DNA, is to tell um, the organism which proteins it needs to make. 
okay, in your body. Maybe you need to make some more hormones. Maybe you need to make some enzymes. Okay, um, maybe the plant, plant cells make hormones. Okay, um, but any protein that needs to be made, the DNA controls that. That's how it controls everything, is by telling it which proteins to make. Okay, and we have what is called the universal genetic code. Okay, and the universal genetic code is what we see down here. Okay, and this universal genetic code is, let me write that out for you. Wow. Okay, so the universal genetic code states that all organisms use the same code for their proteins. For instance, let's look down here at this picture that we have down here. Okay, and so I have some messenger RNA here, and messenger RNA comes from this DNA. This DNA strand would tell this messenger, uh, messenger RNA strand what it should look like. And then you'll see this messenger RNA strand is turning into amino acids. Well, if y'all remember, amino acids are our monomer for proteins. So when I link all these amino acids together down here, I end up with a protein. That was, I determined what protein I was going to make based on this DNA, right? The DNA told the messenger RNA, the messenger RNA then got that information translated into amino acids, therefore a protein. Well, my universal genetic code states that if, for example, AUG codes for methionine, and this was a plant protein, if I saw AUG in a human cell, it would still code for methionine. If I saw AUG in a um, fly cell, it would code for methionine. If I saw AUG in a fungus cell, it would code for methionine. So that's our universal genetic code, that these little sections of messenger RNA and DNA, uh, messenger RNA and DNA they code for the same amino acid, no matter what organism you find it in. And so something I left off real quick is that this information is stored in the sequence of the nitrogen bases. You know, we talk about DNA containing our genetic information, our genetic material. Well, all of that information is going to be based on the order that the nitrogen bases are in. And we'll look at those nitrogen bases in just a minute. Okay, so what we have here then is our structure. So let's look at a little bit about our structure of DNA to see how it's going to allow for this function, this do its job of coding for proteins. Okay, so DNA is a polymer. So our DNA molecule is a polymer. And it's made up of the monomer nucleotides. So our monomer of DNA, of all of our nucleic acids, DNA or RNA, is a nucleotide. If you remember, a nucleotide is made up of a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. So if we look at this little picture of DNA over here on the side, you'll see, remember, it's a polymer, so it's lots and lots of monomers. Here's all my monomers. All these monomers here linked together. Okay? That's what makes up my polymer. Remember, poly means many. Okay? So I've got my sugar, my phosphate, my nitrogen base that make up my nucleotide. Okay? The sugar for DNA is um, deoxyribose. The phosphate group, obviously there's no variety there, okay? but our sugar is deoxyribose, which we need to remember, and we have four different nitrogen bases. So these are our four nitrogen bases. Okay? I've got adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And these are grouped into two categories. Okay? I've got purines and pyrimidines. Okay? Purines are the two ring structures. So for example, adenine and guanine, those would be purines. They're the double ring structures. Pyrimidines are our single ring structures. Cytosine and thymine and uracil, which is in RNA. Okay? Thymine is in DNA only. And so uracil takes its place in RNA. So we've got purines versus pyrimidines. Okay, you'll notice all these nitrogen bases, they contain nitrogen, right? That would be why they're called a nitrogen base. And they're going to pair up together in our DNA. Okay? But we do, need to look at, uh, we do need to 
one of the ways we can remember our pyrimidines and our purines is that pyrimidines are cut from purines. Okay, pyrimidines are cut. Okay, so my pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil, thymine. So pyrimidines are cut, okay, cytosine, uracil, thymine from purines. All right, purines are my double ring structure, and I could cut that to make a pyrimidine. Right? I can't cut a pyrimidine to make a purine. Okay? So pyrimidines are cut from purines. One of the things I also use to remember them is that my big long word, pyrimidine, is actually my small molecule. And my short word is my bigger molecule. So, these, um, so when these bases pair up, Okay, and we'll talk about their pairing structure on the next slide. But when these bases pair up, they form the DNA molecule. Okay, and the DNA molecule is a double-stranded. So by double-stranded, we've got one strand and two strands. Okay, so this is a double-stranded molecule. They're joined together by these nitrogen bases. I've got my repeating monomers so that I get my polymer structure, right, monomer, nucleotide monomer, monomer that has my sugar, deoxyribose, my phosphate, and one of the nitrogen bases. Okay. It's going to also be twisted into this double helix form. Okay. That's what this spiral shape is here, is a helix, and there's two of them, right? So it's a double helix form. Okay. And again, like we mentioned before, that information okay, is carried here in the sequence of the nitrogen bases. So let me erase some of this so we can see this. Okay. So the information, that genetic information, how we're going to code, which protein we're going to code for, is all based on the order of those nitrogen bases. So you've got these nitrogen bases right here in the middle. The order of these, the fact that this is A, T, G, G, C, A, will determine which particular amino acid it's going to code for. And remember, our proteins are made up of amino acids. So the order of those nitrogen bases is very important to, to actually carrying the information. So let's take a look here at how these nitrogen bases pair up to determine um, order and to determine sequencing and structure here. So our nitrogen bases, they pair up A to T, C to G. Okay, so you'll see everywhere I have a T, it's paired with an A. Right, A to T or T to A, doesn't matter, okay, everywhere I see those, those two are paired up. A to T, C to G, okay, A to T, C to G. So anytime I see a C or a G, those two pair up. And there are no exceptions to this, okay, an A will never pair with a C, and A will never pair with a G, okay, it is always A to T, C to G. Okay, um, one of the ways we can remember this is A and T actually make a word, at. Okay, um, Garfield the cat as a way to remember the two of those. Um, you could also think that letters with straight lines. You know, I've got my A, T have straight lines. Those go together. Letters with curves, those go together. Okay, but again, there are no exceptions to these rules. A to T, C to G. Um, and these are going to be held together. Let me bring this picture up over here. These are going to be held together by, whoa, grab the wrong one. Okay. These are going to be held together by what are called hydrogen bonds. Okay. So our hydrogen bonds, these are the bonds that we see here in the middle. Okay. So you see these little dotted lines that are holding those together? Okay, these little dotted lines, these are hydrogen bonds. Okay, and hydrogen bonds are relatively weak bonds. Okay, they are relatively easy to split apart because sometimes, because that's since the order of the nitrogen bases is where the information is stored, sometimes we'll need to actually get to those nitrogen bases. And if you remember back from our pictures of DNA, and if you look at um, this picture here, so if we're looking at this one here with the blue, 
Okay, our, you'll notice we've got our sugar phosphate backbone. So here's my sugar phosphate backbone repeating here, and my nitrogen bases are stuck in the middle. So I need a bond that's relatively easy in the middle of those two bases between the A and T here, between the C and the G. I need bonds that are relatively easy to break apart so I can actually get to the sequence because my sugar phosphate backbone okay, kind of seals it up on the edges and protects it. So those hydrogen bonds, let me try to bring this forward again so you can see it. Okay, I'm bringing the wrong thing forward. Okay, here we go. So these hydrogen bonds in the middle between our adenines and thymines, they're going to be what help hold them together. And if you'll notice as you look at this drawing, adenine is green, thymine is purple. So anytime you see those two, they're bonded together. Okay, guanine is blue, cytosine is red, they're bonded together. You'll also notice I've got a purine. Okay, I've got a purine with a pyrimidine every single time. So I've got one of those double ring structures with a single ring structure. Okay, so these DNA structures, the order of the nitrogen bases, okay, the way they bond together, that plays an important role in its function, okay, which is to code for proteins. Right? And we, those DNA carry all those different genes that code for the individual proteins. Remember, a gene codes for a protein. Right? So we'll be working with DNA structure and function next class and carrying that into protein synthesis. We're going to learn how to actually make the protein.